Amen. How many of you are excited about hearing the Word today? Yeah. Amen. All two of you. I'm pumped about that. <laughs> Amen. I want you to find your place. I was going to do a couple of announcements. I'm not. I want you to jump into the book of Judges. Uh, uh, it's in the Old Testament. Go to the table of contents if you'd like uh, and find that in your Bible. If, you, if you're not sure where it is, you're on your app or whatever you're using, we'll also have it up on the screen. Uh, we're going to, uh, you find your place in Judges 14. I'm going to share just a small passage from 13, but you find your place in Judges chapter 14. I believe that God is on the move. Amen? I believe that He wants to move in our church, and I believe that He is moving in our church. How many are thankful that you have a church you can come and worship freely, be yourself, be forgiven, and be changed at the same time? Come on. Amen. There are, there are great and wonderful churches in our city and our area. We're thankful that you are here. And wherever God wants you is where we want you to be. Amen? Amen. Amen. So if you find your place in the book of Judges, I'm going to begin uh, in, 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 part, in chapter 13 just to catch us up very quickly. But in, in chapter 14 is where, is where you can find yourself. Samson, the strongest man ever. If I say tough guy. Samson was a tough guy. I know we've got some tough guys in here. I want to share with you something, and just to catch you up, because you got, if you're going to come to church, you can scream and shout about a lot of great things about God, but you also have to learn. Everybody say learn. learn. And so Samson's parents have been told that they're going to have this child, that he's supposed to be uh, uh, set apart, that he, he's supposed to take a Nazarite vow, that, that even as a pregnant wife, that she was supposed to go ahead and set aside and start that, that whole Nazarite vow. And the promise has come to pass. And here it is in Judges 13. It says, The woman gave birth to a boy and named him Samson, which Samson means like the sun. S-U-N, not S-O-N. And so uh, Samson means like the sun. It says he grew and the Lord blessed him. How many of y'all want to grow and be blessed? I do too, I do too. And the Spirit of the Lord began to stir him. And I'll stop there. And last week we talked about uh, the, the stirring. The stirring means it's an urge or to drive. And I really believe that God has begun to stir something in our people. He is driving us towards Him. He is driving us towards this community. He wants to stir our families. He wants to stir our friends. He wants to stir the community for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. And so, in Judges chapter 14, here we find out that we have made our way. The boy is born and now he's grown. And what do grown boys do? They go looking for women. Now Samson was, was supposed to be raised up to start the process of redeeming God's people from the Philistines whom they had pretty much fallen into the hands of because they were so disobedient to God that their disobedience led to God's judgment. And so they've fallen into the hands of the Philistines. But here we have Samson. And he says, he goes down to Timnah. Now notice it, it'll never mention this girl's name. It's interesting. This is not Delilah. Delilah will be later on. Everybody say, wait. wait. Well, we'll do Delilah maybe next week. But this is a different lady. Samson goes down to Timnah. And at Timnah, he saw one of the daughters of the Philistines. Oh boy. Then he came up and told his father and mother, I saw one of the daughters of the Philistines at Timnah. Now get her for me as my wife. Samson had love at first sight, parent. He said, Mama, Daddy, go get me that girl. Now your mom and dad told you to go get that girl's number, didn't they? He said, whoo, man, I saw this. I saw this woman down there. And I don't know if he was singing or not. And he said, man, go get that girl from me. And so his parents had a reaction. <laughs> this might have been some of your parents' reaction. I don't know. All right? But his parents had a reaction. His father and mother told him, is there not a woman among the, 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 the daughters of your relatives? And I know it's Arkansas, but we don't do that. All right? 
But is there not a, a woman among the daughters of your relatives or among our people? Like, like somebody like us, somebody, somebody on our side, somebody that, 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 that that's like us. And that, that, that you must go and take a wife from the uncircumcised Philistines? Like, Samson, why go there? There's all these women here. You can, you can have them. And the Bible says, But Samson said to his father, Get her for me, for she is right in my eyes. And I just want to pause right there. Now, God is in this situation. Okay. Now, I think Samson really makes life hard on himself because he's so stubborn and he has so much strength that he just totally just bypasses sometimes following God and he just goes by his own urges and his own desires. How many of you know, if you only date a person, ladies and gentlemen, if you only seek out a person who seems right in your eyes, come on, that can be a little dangerous. They need to be more than just right in your eyes, don't they, church? And look, look I'm going to tell you, find your pretty woman. I found me one. But just because she seems right in your eyes doesn't mean she seems right in God's eyes. Just because he seems right in your eyes. How do you know? If you don't have something, you, you may look great on the outside. And you may look wonderful on the outside. But if there is not the Spirit of God on the inside, what are you doing with them? And Samson says, I mean, his parents are kind of like, they're getting someone that's the enemy. He's trying to marry the enemy. He's trying to marry someone from a tribe that he's supposed to deliver his people from. Like, that's not what, that's not how you do it. But this particular case, in this instance, here's what, here's what the Bible says. And by the way, this is not a sermon for you to just go to your parents and say, well, you know, you don't know that she's right for me, but I do, right? Sometimes we need to listen to our parents, don't we, church? Because they've been there and done that, whether you want to believe it or not. Somehow they got to the bright age of 29 and they stopped turning, they stopped, you know, they're 29 every year now. Somehow they got to that point. It says his father and mother did not know it was from who? It's from the Lord. For he was seeking an opportunity against the Philistines. At that time, the Philistines ruled over Israel. So his parents did not see what God was doing. And then I have some if you'd like to take notes and fill those little, little places out for you. Right there in your bulletin. Other people may not know or agree with what God is calling you to do. And I'm going to define that. I'm going to talk about that. But I want you to get this. Other people might, may not know or agree with what God is calling you to do. I can tell you this. God is not calling you to go marry a Philistine. Come on, somebody. I can promise you this. God is not asking you to, 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 to go and marry somebody who, who doesn't know Jesus because what has He taught? He's taught us not to be unequally yoked. If you're going to date somebody, you're going to be with somebody, they need to come from the same faith as you. But in this particular situation, his family, his parents, did not know that God was up to something. You say, well, why are you telling me this? I've been married. I'm married. I got, I got the t-shirt. I got four or five t-shirts. I'm telling you this because God is stirring some of you to take a step forward in your faith. And you live with people. Uh-oh. You live around people. You work around people. I really sense that you live with. I sense that. You may live with people who don't understand the calling of God. I wonder how many people would have surrendered their life to Jesus and, and, and not just come to church. Church is a beautiful thing. We need to be a part of church. But how many people have been held back from what, what God wants them to do because there's another piece to the puzzle who doesn't agree with their faith? Come on, somebody. It's real quiet, but I'm, this is very, very serious stuff. 
Don't let somebody else, whether it be brother, sister, mother, uncle, grandma, grandpa, uh, step this, step that, whether it be friend, foe, or whatever it may be, do not let someone keep you from Jesus. I'm telling you, it'll be some of the hardest steps you've ever taken because it's like they are over there and God is calling you to, to another place. And, and, and listen, I know it gets complicated and I, I'm not telling you that it's easy and I'm not preaching as if, as if this, is, this is just some, some thing that's this is always going to be an easy walk for you. But I'm telling you this, you need to be paired with people who push you towards the will of God and not paired with people who push you away from the will of God just because they look good and they smell good and maybe they got a little money in a bank. Come on, somebody. It's good preaching. And so what I'm telling you this morning, and I, I feel this, I really do. You need to be stepping towards people that are going to push you they're going to support you. They're going to lift you up in the things of God. Because y'all, listen, people all the time lead you away from Christ. And you say, nobody tells me I shouldn't be a Christian. No, but they, they, they laugh a little, they mock a little, they get uncomfortable a little when they find out how on fire you are for God. When you come home, and, and, and let's say a child gets saved today and his parents aren't saved, not even close to it. And that child goes home and he tells his parents and he or she tells her parents how wonderful that they feel like God is and how wonderful this is and that and the other. How do you know that, that there are parents who say, man, you don't need to be in all that religious stuff. You wouldn't think somebody would say that, but they would. Because church is just full of a bunch of hypocrites. I don't even know why you want to go, son. I'm on something today. Church is just full of, why, 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 did you, why, 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 did you read your Bible now? Where'd that come from? I know how, I know who you are. Mm-hmm. You tell them, yeah, I, I, who, who am I? Uh, uh, well, well, you say that you know who I am, but Jesus says that when I come to Him, that He forgives me of my sin, that I'm part of the fold now, that I'm, I'm a Christian, I'm born again, I'm not just some old, nasty, old, dead sinner anymore. I'm filled with the Holy Ghost of God. i got a purpose in this life. You know the old me, but God's trying to do something new, and you are in a wrestling match with the old you in the old life. And I'm telling you right now, you if you got to be in church five, six times, I'll tell you where a key is. I'll help you get in. Whatever you got if you got to come to the altar every night, whatever it takes, if you got to be uncomfortable and start telling someone else about your struggles, then you need to do that. If you got to fill out a prayer card this morning and say, listen, I am struggling taking that now, that everybody else is pulling me away from God when I'm trying to come to God. Can I just tell you, they don't always know the will of God. Amen. When we began our church, there were people God-fearing people who love Jesus. I had a professor, some uh, a, a doctor, he had a doctorate. You know, I didn't get mine. I got 96 hours of an end of and thought, geez, if I ain't found Jesus by now, I'll never win. 96 more hours? Oh my gosh. Anybody can do it, by the way. You can do it too. Hey, he emailed that. I, I, I emailed this. I thought, man, I, you know what I'll do? I'll email this professor and I'll say, okay, uh, uh, do you got anybody that would be interested in helping plant a church or start a church? Anybody that would be interested in helping out with students or, or any kind of thing? Just You got anybody that would be musicians or whatever it may be? That guy emails me back and I'm sure he loves Jesus. He emails me back and as he's way up here and I'm way down here, you ever felt like that before? I mean, I'm not that tall, so sometimes I feel that way. He emails me back like, well, why, why do you want to start a church? Why do you even want to start a church? There's plenty of churches. How many of you know? Poor guy had a Samson parent moment. He didn't know God wanted to do something. He, look, it wasn't that he didn't know God. It wasn't that he didn't love God. But, but, but in his eyes, how many of y'all know? In his eyes, it was off. And we would not be here today if there hadn't been other people on the other side encouraging you to go ahead and do what God had called you to do. And I'm telling you this morning, your spiritual life is at a point. Listen, you can't be halfway into Jesus. You are either in Jesus or out of 
Jesus. There are people that, that they post on social media all day long that, 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 that you can claim to be a Christian, but, but basically what they're saying is you can say you're a Christian and not do anything that's like a Christian. It's real quiet, but this is true. Because it seems right in their eyes. But Christians follow Jesus. Christians pray. Christians read their Bible. Christians are committed. They find out their gifts. They put them in practice. Christians find a church. And whenever they find the right place, they set their feet down and they serve. Christians live like Christians. Christians also make mistakes. But Christians, when they make mistakes, they admit their faults. They go back before God. They repent. And they come back to Jesus. It's time for people to act like Christians. If we're a Christian, let's be Christian. Come on, somebody. So other people may not know, they may not agree. I had a, look, I had another doctor. It was an optometrist. I don't know why these doctors keep telling me that. Maybe I'm gonna get a doctor, so maybe they'll listen to me next time. Yeah. I don't know. I, I, I was in college and, and uh, it, 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 I really enjoyed college. College was great. And student loans were terrible. <laughs> and and I was starting to make that turn into the ministry. And he's asking me questions and this, that, and the other. And we're talking. And, 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 I, and I was previously going to go into coaching and, and you know, uh, coach baseball and learn, learn some more football stuff. And, you know, you know, you know maybe, maybe be the head coach of the Dallas Cowboys someday after Jerry Jones retired. Anyway, anyway like, like I, had this, I had this plan. I was going to be a coach. And I started going to the ministry. So I started getting, I started getting these, little, these little places. Uh, they're not really gigs, but I started getting these opportunities to preach to students or adults or wherever it was. There's a, lot, there's a lot of churches that need pastors, so I go around and I preach wherever they would let me preach. I mean, I would preach for gas money. Somebody say amen. amen. I, said, I don't understand this. Like, well, I, I used to drive two hours for, for a $50 sermon, and all I did was pay for my gas. And you know what? I was happy about that. I don't know what's wrong with these people these days. But this doctor, this optometrist, I said, I really, I, I, honestly, he's asked me about my life. I'm like, well, I went into coaching, but I really, I really feel myself, I, I feel like I may start going to the ministry. Oh, no, you shouldn't do that. Doesn't know me from Adam. Come on. <laughs> oh, no, you should just stick to coaching. Because it seemed right in his eyes, literally, the optometrist, You've been with me 20 minutes and you decided God hadn't called me into ministry. How many people do that to you? Hey, you're not really smart enough. Nah, you got too much sin. They just nanny. No, I don't no, 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 no. Your husband won't like it. Your wife won't like it. Your ex-husband won't like it. Your cousin won't like it. Your cousin slash sister, we don't know what they are. They won't like it. And all of a sudden, <laughs> <Shit is funny. laughs> and all of a sudden, you have talked yourself out of doing what you know is right in your eyes that God has put on your heart. And I rebuke that mess off of you in Jesus' name. Stop listening to what other people say about you. And start listening to God. You know what? That Facebook status might not have been for you. It might have been for somebody else. We pick and choose what's right for us and what's not right for us. Can I just... The Bible is clear. God's people are called not to just go fishing at the local pond. He's called us to be fishers of men. He is calling you. You say, I don't know how to fish. Start with a cane pole. Anybody ever use a cane pole? You don't even have to have a truck for a cane pole. You put it out the car. <laughs> Y'all know what I'm talking about. You don't even need a truck. You got to start somewhere. I have to leave room on my nose because that, that's something I didn't see coming. Now here's something else about Samson. Everybody say Samson. There'll probably be another train. We'll pray next time. Regardless of how special, because everybody's special. Right? We're all special. 
or valuable you are in your sight. Now, I know nobody in this room thinks you're valuable in your own sight. Right? Or God's sight. It does not place you above God's rule and law. And now the bottom. Obedience is always required in God's children. Now, it seems like I'm shifting gears, but I'm just leading you into the next part of the passage. And so, regardless how special or valuable you are, I mean, if, 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 if the Ten Commandments were for Moses, they're for me. Right? Like, we make up special rules for ourselves. Like, there's four or five sins that I like to keep on the shelf. You know, like, these are my sins, and me and God, we got a thing. We got a thing. He's cool with that because, because when I get paid on the first, I pay my tithes. And so he's cool with them four or five things that I got on the shelf, right? Like, like here's a, I'm going to do lots of good things to make up for the things that I won't give up. Come on. And God is saying, no, no, no. We need a church. He's stirring. We need to be all in. Everybody say all in. All in. All in. Now here is the first sign of Samson's strength. I promise you that last point, they're going to make sense. But the strongest man ever, Samson. Alright? And behold, so here's what happens. He's, he's, they're, they're, they're headed down the temple to get his woman. He wants to get his woman and everybody's going that way and Samson is heading that way. It says, behold, a young lion. Everybody say lion. So a young lion is, is came toward him and was roaring. That's not good, by the way. I just, you know, it's not good. It says, then the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon him, and although he had nothing in his hand, didn't have a shotgun, didn't have, a, didn't have a, like a, a anything, didn't have anything in his hand, a knife, nothing. It says, he tore the lion in pieces as one tears a young goat. And notice this. Don't forget this. But he did not tell his father or mother what he had done. And so i, I got to stop there just for a second. A, a, a grown man runs into a lion. The lion roars at him. And that dude snatches up that lion and rips that lion up. That's a bad dude right there. That's a bad dude right there. I mean, that's, that's, that's like, that's, like that, 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 that's tough. That's better than WWE right there. That's better than the old WWF because that, that was back when they had the real wrestlers anyway. And he snatches. Oh, you think McGregor, Mayweather's big. Oh, no. McGregor, oh, if it was McGregor Samson, you, you better put all your faith in Samson. Notice I didn't say all your money. I said all your faith. <laughs> and so he rips this lion apart by him. Just, ooh. That's scary. I ain't messing with him. I mess with a lot of people, but I ain't mess with him. And so this is this is what we see. Now Samson may have known that he that he had this ability to, to be destroyed. He may have known before that. He may not have. I don't know. But what we but what we have recorded is that this was the first time you see this man's strength. And he tears this line apart. He won't tell his parents. And then he continues on and, 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 and goes down to see the woman. And notice what he says in verse 7. And he comes back to see her again. He said, he said, Ooh, she's still right in my eyes. He said, I gotta get a second look. Five, six, look. So he still wants this girl. Alright? Y'all still with me? So here we go. Why didn't Samson tell his mother and father about the lion? Now I'm not asking you to give me an answer, I'm just asking you to think about it. Okay? What is one possible answer? Because I'm going to tell you in just a minute. Alright? And hang on to the end because we've got a real important point at the end today. So here's what happens. He goes out. He goes to see her again. They're headed that way. He returns to her and now there's a dead lion. Everybody say lion. Alright, he goes to the carcass and now there's this uh, the honeybees, the, 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 these bees and this swarm of bees. And anyway, it's a dead lion. You remember this. And he, he takes some of the honey and he eats some of the honey. And also what he does is he takes it to his parents to eat it. Now, the, the, the reason why, I'll go back to these points. The reason why I wanted to share that with you is because there's a few things 
that a person like Samson, it was called a Nazarite vow, there were a few things that they were not supposed to do. Okay? And, and I've named them before, but we'll name them again. He was supposed to refrain from wine, well, excuse me, wine and other intoxicating drinks. Anything from the vine, grapes, raisins, wine, any fermented drink like wine or vinegar. So for, for Samson, this was a Nazarite vow he was supposed to do. Okay? He's also to refrain from cutting one's hair for the duration of the vow. Now, those two things we haven't necessarily seen yet, but number three we have. He's, supp he's supposed to avoid coming in contact with a dead body, whether it be an animal or whether it be a person. Okay, Samson knows this. He has been taught this from birth. Okay, this dead animal is laying there. He walks up to it. He touches it. He is, he, he is, now, he is now messed up his Nazarite vow. Okay, and so he touches this dead carcass. And not only does he do that, does, 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 does he go against the Nazarite vow, which he knew he was supposed to be following, he now, that, that makes him unclean. Okay, everybody say unclean. Now that he scoops this up, and he takes his honey, and he takes it to his parents, now what he's done is he's made his parents unclean. Both of them unclean. In fact, what was supposed to happen is there was an eight-day period that he was supposed to, look, if he came in contact with a lion, he killed that lion, and he was in the presence of a dead animal, he was supposed to go back. He was supposed to take a cleansing period of time before he would go on. Samson totally ignores this. His parents now have been touched by something that was in this dead animal. Now they're ceremonially unclean. And Samson just totally skips way over this like, I don't have to worry about that. God loves me. God's favor's on me. And he just totally ignores what he's supposed to be doing. He totally ignores. This is what happens to you. This is what happens to me. We totally ignore the fact. Oh, we want the blessings. We want the things that seem right in our eyes. But we don't want to be clean. We don't want to listen to the verses about not sinning. If I say sin. We don't want to listen to the verses about being obedient in the small things that lead to the big things. They're like Samson was a bit reckless. Now God gave him the strength to kill that lion. And God empowered him to kill that lion. But just because God empowers you to do something doesn't mean you don't have to still follow all the other small things. Some of you need to write that down. We all need to write that down. I mean, no, the small things are important, church. We've got to take a few of those things. And we've got to be careful. We've got to be careful. Now, Samson throws a party. Everybody say party. It's okay to say party in church. We have a, we have a party every Sunday in here. We ought, we ought to come in here with a party mentality. That we are so thankful and so excited that, 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 that God has saved us from our sins. That God is doing something in our life. We should praise God like it is a Holy Ghost party every single day, every single Sunday. Amen? Alright. And so here's what happens. He goes down. He made it there. His family's there. And he throws a party. If you're awake, say, I'm awake. He throws a party and he tells them a riddle. Now this party, he's got at least he's got 30 companions that come, and he makes a bet with them or a riddle. Alright? And he says basically this, verse 14. Samson tells them this. Now remember, he hasn't told anybody about what happened. Alright, so he tells them this riddle. He said, if you can figure out this riddle, then we'll make a bet here. If I if you can't figure it out, you gotta give me 30 linen garments, 30 changes of clothes. Right? And, and, and if you do figure it out, then I owe you those 30 linen garments and change the clothes. And so Samson says to him, out of the ear came something to eat. Okay, the lion is the ear. Y'all still with me? And he says, out of the strong came something sweet, which would be the honey. I just saw the riddle for you. Now Samson tells them that. And by the way, this is a weird bit, but he tells them that. Now, here's what happens four days later. They can't solve the riddle. Anybody surprised? They can't solve it. He hasn't told anyone. So here's what they do. Those so-called companions, they go to Samson's new lady, who's unnamed, 
and her and her dad, so his father-in-law, and they go and they go to him and they say, "We're going to burn you and your father if you don't tell us the answer to this riddle." Now that don't sound like good friends. By the way, if your friends ever come, if they, if they take call cops, come on. Get them out of your house. Smile at them real big. Tell them, you know, something that's not a lie, but get them out of there. Come on. They can't figure out the riddle, so now they're threatening to kill. And how many of you know that this girl who's seen right in his eyes, y'all know women sometimes, man. What, what is the weakness of man? Come on. The lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, those things. Ladies, it may be the same for you. I don't know. And so here's what happens. She comes to him, and Samson's wife wept over him and said, You only hate me. Y'all have done this before. I know we've all done this to our parents, right? You hate me. You don't love me. If you love me, you tell me. Or Grandma, if you love me, you buy that for me. Come on, somebody. And she goes before him, and, and Samson says, no, I'm not saying anything. I'm not telling you. And, 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 and she said, you put a riddle to my people. And you've not told me what it is. And, and, he, and, he, and he, he tells her, he says, look, I ain't even... He didn't say, hey, but that's the Arkansas translation. He says, I ain't even told my own mom and dad. Why am I going to tell you? And so she wept before him the seven days that their feast lasted. And notice this, on the seventh day, I say seventh, because she persisted, oh man, I tell you. On the seventh day, he told her, because she pressed him hard, so he caved, didn't he? Now, I, I can't, I, 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 I don't really honestly have enough time, but, but remember this, because the, the, Samson had a little bit of weakness for women. Before this is over, he'll be with a prostitute and another woman. And so he caved with this woman. And he told her. And so what's this, what's this, that this woman's afraid she's going to be burned. She goes back and she tells him, what happens? They come back with the answer to the riddle. And they say, what is sweeter than honey? What is stronger than a lion? And Samson said this. No, y'all better wake up. Wake up for this, okay? It's important stuff right here. And Samson says to him, if you had not plowed with my heifer, you would not have found out my riddle. Now, Lord have mercy. Now, I'm going to say that again. This is his answer to them. Now, he's going to go beat down 30 men. He's going to take their Philistine men, and he's going to take their garments, and he's going to bring them back. Like, Samson's going to freak out. He's going to have a, a moment where he's empowered again, and, and, and he's going to go to the Philistines. He's going to whip up on them, and he's going to take their clothes, and he brings them back. And so there's another uh, uh, a place of strength. He took down 30 men and they closed and he took them back. But then the man called his wife a heifer. <laughs> now y'all, I, look, I, 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 this, this may sound a little naive. I said, I got to, before I preached it, I, I got to check this out in the Hebrew. Heifer still means cow in the Hebrew. <laughs> I said, maybe the translators got it wrong. And so my final point for you today, and I, this is really important, y'all. My final point for you today, never call your wife a hippie. <laughs> Come on. Never call your wife a hippie. Don't do it. Don't do it. Don't do it. Y'all pray with me. Father, we love you.